I don't want to set the world on fire. And would you welcome Dr. Carol Spanier Ludwig? is hanging over my head right now. Because you remember he quoted the Holy Roman Empire of germination. Well, there was nothing holy about it. There was nothing Roman about it. But it certainly was not an empire. Well, I am neither an historian nor a German. So relax. <laughs> there are many reasons uh, why World War I turned into World War II. Political unrest ranging from the far right to the far left. Hyperinflation, unemployment skyrocketing, economic disaster, a government that couldn't do anything. But I'm not here to debate that. I would like to look at a few of the problems that Germans faced following the war through my cultural and linguistic lens, if I may. The German public, excuse me, the general public, knows an awful lot about the Third German Reich and the 12 years of Nazi regime. You see the map there? The Second German Reich is less familiar. German Reich is, however, the least familiar of all. And you do have handouts of these three maps. This last map showing the Holy Roman Empire, or the first German Reich, also has an overlay of the modern countries of Europe today. So even though there is a less familiarity with the second and the first German Reich, I'd like to um, revisit this, because there is a continuum, a definite continuum. The first German Reich was the Holy Roman Empire of German nation. Notice, it doesn't say of German nations. Even though there were many principalities in Germany, we are talking about a single word, nation, almost in the biblical sense of a tribe of STEM, a linguistic community, or a family. The Holy Roman Empire of German nation, i.e. the first German Reich, lasted from the coronation of Charlemagne as Holy Roman Empire on Christmas Day in 800 by Pope Leo III in St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. And it lasted from that year 800 until 1806, <laughs> when the Holy Roman Empire of German nation was defeated by Napoleon in Jena. Jena is in the former East Germany. It's, of course, now united, etc., in the last 30 years. And that's in what the part of Saxony, Germany. Jena, by the way, was an intellectual and cultural center and the sacking of Jena, a precursor to the fall of Berlin a short time later, just a few days or weeks later, has been likened to the emotional, the national emotionalism that we felt here on 9-11. So the first German Reich is a bit more than a thousand years. It's a very long time. Hitler was making a very direct reference to these thousand years from 800 to 1806, i.e. to the Holy Roman Empire of germination, when he forecasted that the third German Reich to be a Reich should be a Reich of a thousand years. Between 1806, so the sacking of Vienna and then eventually Berlin, and 1871, when the second German Reich appears, German history is pretty messy. 
including a very rudimentary Reich called, well, just a rudimentary Reich. He was after the revolution of 1848. It only lasted a year, 1848 to 1849. So, without getting too much into that, because we have to get to 1919 through the end of World War II, let's go on to the second German Reich. It's also called the German Imperial Reich, and you can understand why. Because the Emperor, or the Kaiser, as was mentioned here, Kaiser Wilhelm II, known to us in English as William II, was also King of Prussia, and he was the monarch in charge. Sometimes the Second German Reich is simply called the German Empire, because Otto von Bismarck had been running the show since 1861 in Prussia, and Prussia was a very powerful entity, not just economically, it was powerful in, in political terms as well. And so Otto von Bismarck was now running that show in all of Germany. The Second German Reich formally began in 1871, when wars ceased, and lasted until, as we saw here, Emperor Wilhelm II, or William II, abdicated on November 9, 1918, to live the rest of his days in the Netherlands, never again to set foot on German soil. By the way, the date, November 9th, is extremely important in German history, at least in modern German history. There are at least six notable events that happened on November 9th. We have the 1848 execution of the left liberal leader, Robert Blum, which was the precursor to the 1848 revolution. Then we have, as we saw in the video, the abdication of Wilhelm II on November 9, 1918. Next, we have a nice thing happening, and that was in 1922, on November 9, Einstein received his Nobel Prize in physics. He is a German. In 1923, we have Hitler unsuccessfully, fortunately, but didn't last too long, unsuccessfully um, uh, being defeated at his putsch in Munich, November 9, 1923. And then many of us know about Kristallnacht, which is in November 9, 1938, when Nazi Germany took over the lives and also the property of the German Jews. Finally, November 9, 1989, we're celebrating that this, this year, is the fall of the Berlin Wall. The defeat of Germany in 1918 brought this monarch to an end, and that is astonishing. However, as we saw in the film, it's somewhat of a zeitgeist, isn't it? A spirit of the time. <clears throat> the defeat of the German Empire was not, only, it was not the only dissolution at the time. We had the civil monarchs. I mean, think about the, Roman, the, the Russian Romanovs, or think about the Habsburgs, the Austrian-Hungarian Habsburgs. I mean, they ruled for such a long time. And the dissolution of the Ottoman Empire, all at one time, as we saw so prominently said in the video. I'd like to talk about the term right a little bit. R-E-I-C-H, right. We've often seen it. It's always capitalized, it's down. But it's all nouns come from verbs, so this noun comes from the word, verb reichen, to reach. As in, reichen sie mir bitte die Güte. In Pennsylvania, German, English, we would say, reach me, please, the letter. <laughs> and in this context, it means as far as the sovereign could reach, which became his realm, his land. And as a sovereign, he owned the, he owned the realm, and he owned the land, and he protected those living in it. Those who lived in each of those principalities, in each prince's realm, were of the same tribe the same family, and therefore automatically have the same interpretation of Christianity. As such, it was a no-brainer to mesh the church with the state, and in this case, the Reich. Over the last two years, much has been said about the Reformation, 
having celebrated on October 31st, 1517, the half millennium, since Martin Luther was said, Luther was said to have posted his 95 uh, theses on the castle church door in Wittenberg, a city in, at that time, in the Duchy of Saxon, Wittenberg, Germany. So as early as the 1520s, Lutheranism, better known in German-speaking cultures today as an evangelical Christianity, not to be likened with any kind of evangelicalism in the United States today, but rather more akin to the word Protestantism, became formally established in various principalities by being declared by the relevant government authorities the official confession of faith of the region, of the realm, of the right, if you will. So when we talk about a right, we need to be sure which one we are talking about and how the word Reich was understood, originating from the notion of land. One thing is clear, people who owned a lot of land became very powerful, leading to monarchs, and finally to a dictatorship, in this case a very nasty one. Another term that needs clarification is Führer. As a verb, Führer, it means to lead or to guide. And there are tons of ways the noun, Führer, can be used, leader or guide. For example, we can talk about every, almost every person over the age of 18 has a Führerschein, has a driver's license, a document that allows a person to lead or to guide something. Or we can talk about all those people in the mountains. They are Bergführer, they are mountain leaders. Or we can talk about it in politics as being Oppositionsführer, as in the leader of the opposition. However, Nazi Germany turned the word Führer into a principle. The term Führer emerged in the early 20s when right-wing parties were struggling amongst themselves, all of which had their own leaders or their own Führer. Hitler saw himself rise quickly from a very small group of workers, and I use this form workers as in the German word Arbeiter, it kind of means unions, in Bavaria. And he became, he became, he became, <laughs> yep. Yep. and he of course became the head of the Nazi party. And since he was elected under a democracy, a week though it was, he demanded that he be called the Führer, as in a title somewhat akin to a monarchical title. Hmm. The title was eventually accompanied by the Roman salute, and was, everybody knows it, I cannot do it, so, and was called a German grieving by the Nazis, being used after 1933 <laughs> Instead of the common Guten Tag, hello, good day. <coughs> or as in the South, Grüß Gott, which originally meant God be with you, God bless you. So Hitler gets elected chancellor of the Reich, the Reich's chancellor. And when President Paul von uh, Hindenburg, the Reich's president, dies, Hitler and his cabinet, of course, merge the president with the chancellor and Hitler becomes Führer and Reichskanzler at the same time. It all happens so quickly, but it has its historical and cultural and linguistic development, and many saw it coming. Like Robert Scholl, the father of Hans and, so and Sophie Scholl. You remember them from the White Rose Movement in Munich during the Third Reich? They were executed for their nonviolent stance against the Nazis. Well, their father was also an activist. He did time in prison, several times, and was eventually beheaded. Early in the game, before Hans and Sophie got in the thick of their political activism, he told them, when the bare existence of a people is eroded, and they see the future only as a gray wall, then they listen to promises more easily without questioning who is making the promises. The word Führer then, if used as a title, 
is definitely referring to Nazism and is illegal in modern Germany and Austria and several other countries. However, when you see or hear the word Führer, one must not get bent out of shape because it is a very common word for God, especially used in tourism. So be careful. <laughs> German-speaking people often talk about, about themselves in reference to where they come from. Oh, he's Prussian, she's a Bavarian, they are Westphalians. Hmm, she's a Swabian, they are Franconians. Even as recently as a couple of years ago, an elderly German friend of ours by the name of Hildegard, a very old name, old German name, and he's the name of Wizzy Gold German, spoke at a memorial service for her dear friend, Law, a shortened form of Hanemar. Hildegard said how she would miss having meaningful conversations with her dear friend, Law, and that even though they came from two different tribes, she said, they understood each other very well and enjoyed decades of deep friendship. Law came from the Swabian area an Alemanni tribe in the southwest near Stuttgart. And Lohr came, um, no, excuse me, and Hildegard came from the Palatin area, a Franconian tribe, obviously near Frankfurt, not far apart from one another in the modern sense. I was a little surprised when I heard her use the term tribe, but it made sense. Hildegard was using the German word stamm, meaning stem. As such, the term Stamm, or Stem, and Nation, Nation, and Folk, Folk, reflect the six German stems. Bavarians, Swabians, also called Alemanni, Franks, Saxons, Frisians of the North, and Thurians. People really relate to their stems, not just as where they come from, but also in their mindset, and especially linguistically. Although Hitler was from one of the southern stems, oh yes, he was born in Austria, but that was all part of the same stem, he knew how to speak to the commonalities of all of these German stems. It was important to him. Folk is a term I have not yet really discussed. Literally, it means people. But there are other words for people. There are three other words for people. This one refers to an, a crowd, an uncounted group of people, like a nation or a race. The English equivalent is, as it sounds, folk. But the German word folk has, in its historical sense, more nationalism in it than folk does in English. Even the current parliament in Berlin which was dedicated a little over a century ago, 1916, to the German folk, Dem Deutschen Volke, as is written above for everybody to see for miles, to the German nation slash race, continues, the, the current German government, of course, continues to honor this inscription. So it's important. Let's figure out how. This sense of folk can be abused or it can be uplifted. Uplifting. As a term, uh, as a term, it was exploited by the Nazi regime, of course, except in such words as Volkswagen. I mean, that's the people's car, which was created in the 1930s anyway. And it has taken a while for Germans to affirm the positive romantic sentiments of the word folk. <coughs> Some say that it wasn't until the World Cup. In, in soccer in 2006, when Germany played host, that the 19th century romantic sense of folk felt like it could be somewhat acknowledged again. And Germany didn't even win the finals. <coughs> Italy did. Germany came in third. In the wake of the dissolution of the Holy Roman Empire of German Mission after 1806, the reference to folk was not so much for a nation as an entity, but it moved into a spirit, a national spirit, a national identity. 
And in the wake of the revolution of 1848, the Frankfurt Parliament attempted to create a national constitution for all German states, uniting them in this spirit. And the Netherlands prevailed all through that century and into the Second German Reich until Hitler took over when he used the term folk in slogans to be extremely nationalistic in the political sense, as in, I'm folk, I'm rough, I'm Führer, a one nation or race, one empire or realm, one leader. Perhaps this is one of the slogans that created one of the most negative impacts on post-war Germany. In my experience with German uh, families, I have constantly heard that the few years following both wars were worse than during the wars. My father-in-law, not Lee's father, uh, my late, uh, my fa the, the father of my late husband, Brian, was born in 1899 in Germany, the same year that Hitler was born. And he was old enough to have felt the consequences of both wars. He was very political, but was drafted into World War II. Fortunately, he did not have to fight. In fact, for a guy who would have fallen apart if he would have had to put a gun in his hand, we would giggle when he talked about how he had to fuel tankers and serve in a mess hall in France. But he was a German soldier. And at the end of the war, he was delivered to a prison camp somewhere in southern Germany in Bavaria, the U.S. Army controlled area at that time, we're talking about the World War II, of course, which must have been in a field because he talked about always getting wet from what we call German weather, the Germans a lot. When released, he walked 350 to 400 miles home to Gelsenkirchen, Germany, in Westphalia, the industrial area, where things were completely bombed out. We would often hear stories about how happy he was to not get wet anymore when he got to his home, when he got to his hometown, not his home, because his wife, a very thrifty and industrious woman like many women of that day, had already organized a tiny abode for the family in the Bombay city. When asked how, why he voted for Hitler, Fatih, as we called him, would simply say, he, he could never say his name, gave us work. And the stories continued. He told us often, as a young adult, 1922, 23, during the hyperinflationary period, that they would take a wheelbarrow of paper money to the bakery to buy a loaf of bread. At first, I was not sure if I had just, if, if, if he had just heard these stories or if, as I had, or Ashley had driven a wheelbarrow full of paper money to the bakery. But I have come to think he did just that, not just once, but many times, and that such an experience had marked him for life. The Weimar, and you see the pictures here, I couldn't find one with a, a wheelbarrow that like I envisioned my father-in-law having done, but there's one on the, the left the bottom. In the, and the other pictures um, I'll be talking about in a moment, so just stay with me. The Weimar Republic, 1919 through 1933, did a very poor job of everything, but especially of controlling the inflation and the economic misery. So the government simply printed more money to pay the debts. There were dire consequences for this, as reparations could not be paid in full. Mm -hmm. In 1919, one loaf of bread, I'll come back to this picture, and you have, we will come back to this picture, but you have it in a, in a handout. Uh, it's just that we couldn't get a good picture of the, um, uh, the real battle without it. Uh, in 1919, one loaf of bread cost one mark. But by 1923, the same loaf of bread cost 100 billion marks. <laughs> and this is just, you know, a picture of a 50 billion mark. So 100 billion marks a, a number of these to put in the room. Soon every town produced its own pro uh, uh, promissory notes, as did banks and businesses. 
Paper money became so non-functional that children played with it. Some used the money to make a mockery of a situation, and those pictures that you saw a moment ago, by making clothing out of paper money, lining walls with paper money, building pyramids with paper money, whatever came to mind. And now we see the children playing with paper money. As my parents-in-law lived in the coal mining area of the Roar Valley, the many visits to their home would show from street to street a collage of the Industrial Revolution from the middle of the 19th century through World War I and on to into the Third Reich when everyone had miners as their neighbors. During the height of hyper uh, infl in, in, uh, inflation, 1922-23, Women could be seen on the top of the coal deposits, searching for pieces of coal, so that they might not be able, so that they might be able to cook and to keep their families warm. Fati was not in a trade, in a world, and was not of the educated class, but he always found work for himself, and he chose a wife who did the same thing. They learned how to survive. A lot of people call those kinds of marriages Kriegsehe, which are marriages during the war. Yes, their apartment was bombed out, but for the majority of the war, the children and the women from the Ruhr Valley, from this valley where uh, the coal mines are, were sent to the east, over to Prussia, to stay away from the threats of the Ruhr area, the industrial region. When life became perilous in the east, they had to be that area, too. And the war children remember, or perhaps they remember stories having been told to them, if they were too young, of the bombs hitting day after day, seeing the injured and the dead bodies on the street, and always being anxious about seeking refuge in the shelters, because shelters were hit as well. Injuries and deaths occurred all over the place, but that was life as they knew it. One had to go on. It was the mindset. There is this expression in Swabian. Uh, Swabia is down where this Hanilor came from, near Stuttgart. It, it, even though it's about 300 miles away from West Haley, where my in-laws live, everyone knew, everyone nationally knew this, didn't it? It went like this. Shafa, shafa, hoist la bawa. And what I didn't put on here was the last two words. Und verrecke, but I'll explain that. Schaffen, the verb schaffen, right here it's an imperative. Schaffen, do it. Schaffen means to get something done. So this ditty, which emerged into a national song, really says, keep at it, keep at it, build a house. And by house, we don't even mean houses that we don't even hear in St. Louis. But houses that are a building, just buildings. The word house is used for building. Build a house, and when you are done with this, do that. And when you are done with that, do this. Never giving up until, and this is the word that is missing, until you croak. <laughs> a good deal, perhaps it's good. A good deal of this shopping actually comes out of the Protestant work ethic. The term coined by 20th century German sociologist Max Weber and became a national work ethic. After World War I, Max Weber himself was among the founders of the liberal German Democratic Party, ran unsuccessfully for a seat in Parliament, and served as advisor to the committee that drafted the ill-fated Democratic uh, Weimar Constitution of 1919. I mean, they had good intentions. It, he is internationally not remembered so much for his political activism, but rather his theory for having named the Protestant work ethic and establishing, of course, the bureaucratic system of management. As, sh as such, he showed us how he attempted, at least, to do something about those right-wing tendencies that were growing. After all, he was a Prussian up there in the north and going over to, in into Poland. A Prussian who grew up learning the Lutheran idea of duty to oneself and society to work diligently. Hard work and diligence were thought to be godly attributes since the 16th century and probably most likely be prior to Luther. 
If I think about the Germans I have known, both in the States and in Europe, whether Protestant, Roman Catholic, or Jewish, I see a nation, I see a race, I see a folk, a people wanting to do their best, sometimes seeming, seemingly aimlessly. I mean, on Friday you have to clean your windows, regardless of whether it rains or not, <laughs> depending upon their context. Jewish Viennese composer, and remember that Austria, I didn't go into the Austrian part, but they were annexed in 1938, and of course, their whole history is bound together, and it was bound together anyway. <laughs> Jewish Viennese composer and conductor, Harald Sifra, so if you know him from the Colbert School of Music, fits into this picture of never giving up. He didn't, he survived. And acting against all odds to make life better in the midst of death, as an inmate in the first concentration camp in Dachau, outside of Munich in May of 1938. I mean, this is just shortly after Austria had been annexed. Zipper ingeniously made life better for many for the year that he spent in Dachau. Later, he was transferred over to, uh, to Buchenwald. to develop his character and his love for humanity. Sometimes he would volunteer for a, demeaning, for a demeaning job, but what he is famous for in this time of history was that he used music and poetry to bolster the spirits of the other inmates. From stolen wood and wire within the camp, he had musical instruments made Eventually, he gathered an orchestra of 14 musicians together and composed music. The orchestra held silent <coughs> rehearsals and gave concerts on Sunday afternoons, as was the cultural custom in German-speaking countries. 
but of course not in a castle or a fine palace or a music hall, but in an unused latrine in the camp. These concerts were a means of keeping alive some small measure of civilization and of res restoring value to their lives. Soon, Zipper found another inmate, Yola Sophie, 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 a poet and a writer, someone who he had known from the days in Vienna. Sophie wrote the lyrics and Zipper composed the music for the Dachau song that you just heard. This song was passed through the camp and eventually made its way to other camps, providing strength and hope to the inmates. The Dachau song was not a folk song. It was not easy to learn. It was said to be difficult to learn, and Zipper wanted it that way, so that prisoners would be led to aspire to a higher level of life, even in their impossible situation. There are many political cabarets of this historical context, like the famous 1997 movie, Life is Beautiful. The Dachau song became such a political cabaret and even used the slogan that was placed at the entrance of many of the, if not all, but many of the concentration camps. Arbeit macht frei. Work sets you free. Arbeit work macht sets free. And you, of course, you know what you just put It was popular since the, 19, since the 1870s. Excuse me. I wanted to also say right here, it's a really an ironic abuse of the Protestant work ethic. The expression Arbeit not Frei, as you see here, work sets you free, was popular since the 1870s in a very positive sense and was used by the Nazis in general while unemployment ran as high as 30% during the Depression. But having it over the entrance to the concentration camp was pure evil thinking. These signs were so prominently displayed and were seen by all prisoners and staff, all who knew, suspected, or quickly learned that prisoners confined there would likely only be set free by death. As such, Arbeit macht frei, work, work sets you free, had a tremendous psychological effect. Uh, is it the last one or is it this one? There it is. Yes. You see the B on Arbeit? Mm -hmm. It's just a little bit different from the other ones. Mm -hmm. We don't know if this is true, but um, the sign has been, some people have interpreted it as, the signs were made by prisoners. So this has been interpreted by some as to been put up in defiance mm -hmm. of what it was supposed to be. So it's a, upside down B. A falsity to the sword in other words. <coughs> Let me lighten the day. Bavaria may have been the venue for Hitler's rise, but it also the venue where persons born in a particular town participate in the passion of Christ every ten years. It's Obramagel. And they've been doing this since 1634, they do it every ten years. Um, a man came home for Christmas one time with the Bobani play, bringing it into Oberammergau, and uh, so the whole town decided that they would pray to God, and if God spared them from the effects of the Bobani play, which, according to legend, God did, then uh, they would perform the Passion play every 10 years. Now, 1634 doesn't fit. It's in the zero number of years, and um, in 1984, they did have a, a, a special one, and they also did, uh, well, not, excuse me, in 1934, they had a special one. In 1984, they had the 351, and, uh, but they otherwise they stick to the zero number of years, as in 2020. The, um, there are over 200 singers. They come from actors, te technicians, and musicians, and they all come from the village. And over on Rakao, is Marilyn here? I mean, yeah, yeah. Hi, Marilyn. You have the text there. You have the, uh, the notes there. I'd like to teach you a little um, song. I, I'm not just not a historian or German. I'm not a singer. But 
Um, these are really easy things, and this is what I mean by folk song versus rock bell song, which is hard. Um, but we have a text to it, so we're going to take this one off the screen, and then you have to, I think you have it in here, here that maybe not. And here are the words, and um, there's English on the bottom, but the English on the bottom will not help us for the tongue twister. Do we have any German-speaking people here today? Well, then maybe we won't do a round. <laughs> but it is, uh, it is done as a round, you know, and I'm thinking of the years. But at any rate, let me go through a little bit of what it is and uh, what we're talking about with Ober Ammergau. First of all, where is Ober Ammergau? Ober Ammergau is in the foothills of the Alps, so it's in the uh, state of Bavaria, um, about two hours south of, uh, an hour and a half south of Munich. And um, Ammergau, uh, first of all, Gau is a meadow or marshland type thing, a meadow. And Amr is a river that flows through this area. And uh, on the same road from when you're coming from Munich, you have, first of all, winter Amr Gau. And then you go a little bit, and I'm sure at one time there was a hamlet called Amr Gau, because I've heard of it somewhere, just couldn't find it. And then, you find it on that. <laughs> and then, of course, over Amr Gau, which is, of course, very famous because of this passion. Uh, play, but also because of other things that they do in the winter, they whittle at wood, and of course all the crafts are very famous all over the world. Um, so the tongue twister part, of course, comes up in the second line. So the first one is, Heut kommt der Hans zu mir. So we're, we're going to do the, the, the melody in just a moment now, okay? Heut kommt der Hans zu mir. Let's try the words. So you can see that Hans is going uh, coming over to see his girlfriend, right? And then there's a comma that says Freud sich dies. Freud sich dies. Once again, Freud sich dies. This is the whole thing. Heute kommt der Hans zu mir. Freud sich dies. Heute kommt der Hans zu mir. Freud sich dies. Let's get it. Heute kommt der Hans zu mir. Freud sich dies. Then we have this line that becomes a tongue twister. Yeah. Oh, meaning weather. Over our. Aber is the butt. Over our. Air being, of course, Hans. Over our. Uber. Uber is via. By way of. Over our. Uber. Over our. Over our. Uber. Over our. Uber. Over our. So if he comes by way of Oberammergau, which is the northern part, or if a southern part, or if he comes by way of Unterammergau, which is north, but down here, because it's in the background. Over our überhaupt no coat. If he comes at all, überhaupt at all. Das ist nicht gewiss. That is not certain. Let's try that second line. <laughs> Very slowly. Over our uber. Over our Over our uber. Unter our cow. Hey, great. A little bit faster. Over our uber. Over our cow. Over our uber. Unter our cow. Over our uber. Home try from the, the second line. Over our uber, over our gal, over our uber, over our gal, over our uber, unter our gal, over our uber, hot nicht kommt, is nicht gewiss. I know it is this nicht gewiss, das ist nicht gewiss, is what we have here. Let's listen to the tune first. Master <laughs> <laughs> slow. Uh, let's try slow. Slow, yeah. yeah. Oh, 
I'm grateful to uh, have a chance to do some reading in preparation for this, and it really has just been um, marvelous to not only reacquaint myself with some of the people in the church movement, the confessing church movement in Germany at that time, um, but to deepen my understanding of what they were dealing with and how they were dealing with it. And I want to introduce you to some of the personalities that became significant in the history of the church's opposition to what was happening in Nazi Germany. Uh, I first read Dietrich Bonhoeffer's book, The Cost of Discipleship, when I was in high school. And uh, so that was my introduction to Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Uh, and he becomes a significant character in the story as we go through the Confessing Church movement. I want to begin with, uh, however, I think this is on. Yeah, there it is. You heard Carol say that in 1922, November the 9th, Albert Einstein won his Nobel Prize and, um, in physics. Uh, However, he was exiled uh, as a Jew and was in this country working at places like Caltech and Princeton University um, and the Institute for Advanced Studies in Princeton. Uh, he had this to say about what he saw in the 1930s, and this was a quote from apparently Time Magazine, uh, December 23, 1940. Being a lover of freedom, when the Nazi revolution came, I looked to the universities to defend it, freedom, knowing that they had always boasted of their devotion to the cause of truth. But no, the universities took refuge in silence. Then I looked to the great editors of the newspapers, whose flaming editorials in days gone by had proclaimed their love of freedom. But they, like the universities, were silenced in a few short weeks. I then addressed myself to the authors, to those who had passed themselves off as the intellectual guides of Germany, and among whom was frequently discussed the question of freedom and its place in modern life. They were, in turn, very silent. <coughs> Only the church stood squarely across the path of Hitler's campaign for suppressing the truth. I never had any special interest in the church before, but now I feel a great affection and admiration for it because the church alone has had the courage and persistence to stand for intellectual truth and moral freedom. And here's an amazing statement. I'm forced to confess that what I once despised, I now praise unreservedly. This is even before the United States has gotten into the war. <laughs> Not everything that the church did in Germany was in opposition to Hitler. And so what I want to do in these next few moments together is just try and give you a little bit of the history of what was happening at the time and what was happening within the church. And you'll have a chance to hear much more about this at the end of October as we talk about the confessing church and then particular the Barman Declaration, which is in the Book of Confessions of the Presbyterian Church USA. You want to answer that maybe? Or is that... <laughs> I, um, some years ago, studying at Luther Seminary in St. Paul, Minnesota, where I did a master's degree, was introduced to Henry Ortel. Henry Ortelt was a survivor of uh, the concentration camps, much like we just were introduced to another survivor. Uh, Henry and his brother uh, were first in Auschwitz, and they were liberated from Flossenburg. Uh, during the war, he spent time in five different concentration camps. And I met him in a class uh, in, at Luther Seminary, and the Lutheran 
Americans have since World War II been trying to understand why it was that so many Christian people in Germany remained passive in the face of what was happening. And um, Henry did a presentation to a class at the seminary, and for several years I invited him and he accepted to come to talk to our confirmation classes at a church that I was serving in Minnesota. And what struck me, he had, he had an hour, and he could have wowed a number of young kids with stories about what it was like when the trains came into the concentration camps, or how the Nazis would separate children from their parents, or the use of dogs uh, to round people up. The, but he didn't spend much time on any of that. What Henry wanted to focus on was what was happening in the early 30s in Germany that led to Auschwitz and Dachau. Because for him, it was dehumanization that occurred in the 30s to which people passively accepted that led ultimately to what we saw in World War II. So he focused with young people on dehumanization wherever it occurs. Um, this will give you a little idea of the history as it was unfolding, and then I want to share with you a little bit about how, what was happening in the church as this history was unfolding. So August 2nd, 1934, Hitler was elected chancellor in 1933. President Hindenburg died, and Hitler quickly abolished the presidency and proclaimed himself Reichsfuhrer, as we just heard. Um, August 4th, even though Hitler, when he was elected chancellor, had this to say at the time, um, the national government will respect the agreements that have been drawn up between the churches and the provincial states. Their rights are not to be infringed. So there was a sense early on, as he was chancellor, that uh, the, the church and the state would not be uh, infringing on each other's rights. But very quickly that changed, and um, the Reich Church the National Church um, began in earnest in uh, very quickly. And so, as you heard with the uh, First Reich, the 1,000 years, part of the design was to reestablish, or part of the vision was to reestablish this Third Reich as a Holy Roman Empire. So quickly, the church began to be co-opted into the state. Now, many of you know that it's common for us to have an American flag in the sanctuary. But with the German experience, with the Nazi flag in the sanctuary, that became a coalescing of church and state in a way that would not be tolerated today. So, uh, April 3rd to 5th in 1933, the German Christians had a national convention. The slogan was, the state of Adolf Hitler appeals to the church and the church has to hear his call. The convention closed by passing a resolution which stated, God has created me a German. Germanism is a gift of God. God wants me to fight for my Germany. Military service is in no sense a violation of Christian conscience, but it's obedience to God. The believer possesses the right of revolution against a state that furthers the powers of darkness. He also has, his, has this right in the face of a church board that does not unreservedly acknowledge the exaltation of the nation. For a German, the church is the fellowship of believers, 
who are obligated to fight for a Christian Germany. The goal of the faith movement of German Christians is an evangelical German Reich church. It was 1933. So very quickly you can see the, the movement away from a, a respect for the church and its independence to a co-opting of the church into this movement and the use of religious language. And of course, uh, it's fairly well known that Martin Luther, at the end of his life in the Reformation, was uh, wrote things that were terribly anti-Semitic. And so this was picked up, and in a sense, there was a, a sense in which what was going to happen now was that the Reformation was going to be complete. This is what Germany always was intended to be. <clears throat> the goal, this was a, a statement released to the press, the goal is the fulfillment of the longing of evangelical Germans since the time of the Reformation. <clears throat> the situation is as follows, the German Christians want an evangelical German right church. And so this was released to the press. All of a sudden, all of this was beginning to develop in a way that made pastors remarkably uncomfortable. So, the church senate of the Prussian church elects Mueller, president of the consistory, and gives the title of bishop to him. And he's elected Reich bishop on September 27th. The Pastors' Emergency League was established the previous year in 1933 by Martin Niemöller, Reverend Niemöller. And immediately a letter went out and 3,000 pastors joined the Pastors' Emergency League to protect pastors from being uh, punished for efforts to speak plainly the gospel in their pulpits. <laughs> By January 1934, 7,000 members had joined the Pastors' Emergency League. And they opposed the German Christians who sought to establish this new German national church. November 19, 1933, 3,000 ministers read a denunciation of the church government from their pulpits throughout Germany. And January 25th, 1934, Niemöller is called, and he speaks directly to Hitler. Here's what happened. <clears throat> Hitler decided to intervene because things were spinning out of control in the church, and this opposition to the German church had developed. He summoned 40 prominent church leaders to the Reich Chancellery on January 25th. Mueller, at his side, who was the head of the German Christian Church, Hitler began the meeting by reading a prepared statement, but only after a few lines he was rudely interrupted by Goring, who created dissension by describing a taped phone conversation between Niemöller and Walter Kunath co-chairman of the Young Reformation Movement. Hitler exploded in rage at the information Goring related. Niemöller tried to explain to which Hitler replied, you leave the care of the Third Reich to me and you look after the church. Goring further agitated the situation by claiming that the pastor's emergency league had foreign connections. And as the clergymen were leaving, Niemöller addressed Hitler, Herr Reich Chancellor. You said just now, I will take care of the German people. But we too, as Christians and churchmen, have a responsibility towards the German people. That responsibility was entrusted to us by God, and neither you nor anyone in this world has the power to take it from us. The next morning, January 26, 1934, was a dark one for Martin Niemöller. All but one of the clergymen who had been in attendance with him in Hitler's office felt his outspokenness had ruined 
their only chance to patch things up with the Fuhrer. <clears throat> they drew up a condemnation of Niemöller and they withdrew in mass from the pastor's emergency league. <clears throat> Martin Niemöller would be ultimately imprisoned and spent eight years during the war <clears throat> in concentration camps. This is Martin Niemöller. He's most famously known for a comment that he made after the war. First they came for the socialists, and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. <laughs> then they came for the trade unionists, and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. <clears throat> then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. So Martin Niemöller uh, was actually one who did speak out in significant ways and was imprisoned for it, but he survived during the war. Another important person in this period is Karl Barth. Karl Barth was born in Basel, Switzerland in 1886. In 1904, he matriculated in the theology faculty in Bern. And from 1911 to 1921, he was, was a pastor. And as a pastor, he was reworking his theology as he worked on a commentary on Romans. The first edition came out during his pastorate. He was trained in German liberalism in theology and he really took issue with his professors. Uh, he came to uh, write the church dogmatics later in his teaching career as a professor. And in the dogmatics, it came to be known as neo-orthodoxy. Uh, he rejected many of the assumptions of his professors. And he found himself much more significantly focused on the scripture, and in particular, the scripture's witness to Jesus Christ. Christology became the lens through which so much of his theology was written. Uh, he became a professor of theology in 1921 to 1930, and that was the period where he wrote his church dogmatics, which is voluminous. Um, and uh, 1930 to 1935 were his years at Bonn teaching and it was 1934 where he was the primary author of the Barman Declaration, along with two others. Uh, from 1935 to 1946, at the end of the war, he returned to Switzerland. He was, after all, Swiss nationality. Uh, he died much later in 1968 and made a, a, a very interesting visit to the United States. I think it was 1962. You'll hear a little bit more about that later. But one of the things I love about that uh, is the story is he, he visited Princeton Theological Seminary. But the story is he got off uh, in New York and a reporter was there, knew that he was an important person and essentially asked him to sum up the church dogmatics in a sentence or two. <laughs> <laughs> to which he said, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And it was great that he could get it all in that sort of yes. thing. But uh, I want to invite Carol back up here to say a word or two about language and Karl Barth's use of language. Carol. Yeah, please do. I think it's on, yes. Yeah. One of the things <laughs> one of the things that I did at Claremont Graduate University for about three to five years was I was teaching doctoral students um, in German because they have to have it as one of the hoops to get through. And um, from almost any of them, not just religion students. And uh, I got there are prescribed texts, and one of the texts was a Bart text. And uh, I found that the language of Bart was so <laughs> spiral, you could get it. So he had this little, um, 
he had this little parish in, in Switzerland, and it's almost like, well, you know, if a professor is going to be your, your pastor, and he speaks like he's coming out of the church dogmatic, dogmatics, how are you going to understand this? But in his way of spiraling the language together, I'm sure, in their way, they were able to say amen, and not, of course, at the dinner table be able to recount what he actually said, but to get it. Now, the three words that I, uh, they're on the screen right now, the three words that I kind of picked up, and a uh, guy by the name of Frank Rogers, who is, has been at Claremont School of Theology, he's also from Princeton Seminary, and I worked with him at a Claremont School of Theology, um, <coughs> And I think it was during that time that it came to me what was really going on here, and I think this is part of Frank Rogers' work as well. The word can means to know by experience. So you often know, uh, we have some linguists here, and you often know in all these languages that you have, you have a verb for to know a fact, and you have a verb for to know experience, etc. whereas English just knows things. So to know by experience is the word can. can. But when you start to add, um, some prefixes to it, and these are so-called inseparable prefixes, so they're more entwined. You know, a separable <coughs> prefix will be one that throws the, the prefix to the end, like make the light out, you know, that comes from asmacher. Whereas this is erkenen. Now, the er prefix, there's something going on in the body when you put an er onto a word, so you're really getting it, and so that's why that word changes into recognize, hey, I, I understand. So you experience Christianity all your life, and all of a sudden, you are a canon. You know, you really recognize it. But that wasn't enough for Bart, because what he needed for people to do himself as well was to use the BE prefix, the inseparable prefix, and that's thrust forward. That means that you really um, get out there and do something about it, so you Con confess, you, you confess it. Well, if you're going to confess it to yourself, that's just kind of air cannon again. You've got to get it out to somebody else. So it's thrust forward all the time. And I think that's uh, what we wanted to say, right? One more, okay. Then, of course, oh gosh. There's just as, you know, these long German sentences, and so these poor students would have to figure out that really what Bart was saying is, you better get in there and represent yourself out there in the public. Um, so the sich is, is, is the oneself, and the einsetzen is to set in. You set one yourself into something. That's coming out of this bekennen. So from kennen to erkennen, you got it, and now bekennen. And not just go out and confess it like, you know, hey, this is it. Uh, have your flag, but do something about it. Sich einsetzen. Hmm? Mm. In addition to Carl Bard, thank you. In addition to Carl Bard, and I'll conclude with a uh, little discussion of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer was much younger than Carl Bard, born in 1906. Uh, his father was a very renowned neuropsychiatrist. So he grew up in a very well-educated uh, family. And he began his theological studies in 1923. Um, he was part of a larger family. His brother, when he said he was going to study theology, uh, made a derogatory comment about the church. And, uh, and Dietrich Bonhoeffer responded, well, then I'll have to change the church. <laughs> uh, he grew up in a family that had um, very dedicated um, piety as a family. They prayed together, they read scripture together. They didn't attend church with regularity. But Christian faith was so much a part of their family life. It wasn't until later that Dietrich Bonhoeffer really dedicated himself to the church and its influence. Uh, 1927, he completed his doctoral thesis, and it was on the communion of saints. 
So his doctoral thesis was working on what is the church? Uh, when he visited the United States for the first time, he did so in 1930. And it was quite an experience for him. This was, of course, uh, prior to the election of Hitler and all the changes that would have happened in 1933 and 34. So it was an easier time. However, as we heard from Carol, it was a difficult time in Germany with inflation as it was and a variety of things that were happening. Um, and uh, one of the things that Dietrich Bonhoeffer really liked about uh, his visit to Union Seminary in New York City was he went to uh, African American churches and he so appreciated the African American traditions. In fact, he went back to Germany with albums uh, of choirs and that sort of thing from African American churches and he played them later for his students in places like Finkenwald and elsewhere. Uh, he became a lecturer in Berlin University in 1931. And in 1933, he joined Martin Niemöller in warning about Germany's, uh, warning the German ministers of the danger of Nazi rule. Uh, 1934, he begins helping to organize the confessing church movement. 1935, he teaches at Finkenwald Seminary, which was a seminary that was established by the Confessing Church, which is now broken away from the German Christian Church. And um, his little book, Life Together, is about the experience of teaching in that seminary. Um, 1936, he is no longer permitted to teach at Berlin University. 1937, the Finkenwald Seminary is closed by the Gestapo, and that's the year that The Cost of Discipleship was published. 1938, he's pro prohibited from doing any pastoral work or teaching because of his opposition. He goes to England in 1939 and again to the United States, but within weeks, he returns to Germany. There's a uh, little quote from Karl Barth. Karl Barth writes to him at this time in 1939 and asks why he has left and uh, invites him to come back to Germany. And Karl Barth, later on in life, felt that he essentially contributed to signing Bonhoeffer's death certificate as a source of some uh, difficulty for Karl Barth later in life. But he comes back into Germany because he feels he cannot participate in the reconstruction of Germany if he's not present. He's prohibited from making any speeches in 1940. He travels to Norway and Switzerland under heavy suspicion in 1941 and 42. And uh, the whole conspiracy that was developing to, uh, to assassinate Hitler, to remove him from office from within the country, was picking up steam. And it really picked up steam after Hitler launched the Western Front uh, I mean the Eastern Front with, um, with Russia and commanded his troops to kill all the Russian soldiers, generals, everybody. And so all of a sudden within the uh, power structure in Germany, there's resentment at this, there's this feeling that this is a horrible moral violation amongst generals and there begins to be this resurgent of, of an idea that we have to remove him. And Bonhoeffer was participating in some of his interactions with uh, what the reconstruction might look like, what kind of terms there might be. So his participation at all in this effort landed him in jail. Um, he was uh, engaged to Mar Maria von Weidemeyer three months Later, after that engagement, he was arrested in 1943. 
He was moved to the Gestapo prison in Berlin in 44, and in 45 he was moved to Buchenwald and finally Flossenburg, court-martialed, executed on April 9, 1945, just days before the camp was liberated by the Allies. And I believe it was by special order of Himmler. Um, so uh, his life was short. He was 39 years old when he was, when he was executed. But a remarkable life. And he captures a great deal, I think, of um, of the uh, spirit One of his favorite verses was, we do not know what to do, but our eyes are upon you, from 2 Chronicles 2012. He was so convinced in the centrality of Christ. The incarnate, crucified, and risen Christ was located not in the private conscience or in the immortal soul or the spiritual experience of the religious yearnings of the individual but rather in the center of history and therefore in the life of this world. Karl Barth began his ethics. He never completed it. It was completed posthumously. He actually attempted to write his ethics on four different occasions. His letters and papers from prison are remarkable to read. Um, and in Christmas 1942, he wrote this. There are persons who think it inane and Christians who think it impious to hope for a better earthly future and to prepare for it. They believe in chaos, disorder, catastrophe as the meaning of present events, and in resignation or in flight from the world, they give up all responsibility for further life, for new constructions, for the coming generation. It may be that the world will end tomorrow. If so, we will gladly lay down our work for a better future, but not until then. So Karl, uh, I mean, um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, I think represented one in the Confessing Church movement who opposed what was happening on theological grounds. And because of that, they took his life. Uh, I'm going to leave it there because we're out of time. But um, let me open it up for questions that you might have about the period. I know that we've sort of built in some of the opposition that was developing during this time. And Linda Molno next week will give you more hooks for what was happening and the development of anti-Semitism and a variety of other things. But let me open it up for questions now. Uh, both Carol and I are here to respond. Here. It's a good question. I think, um, as Carol said earlier, there was this sense of what they called the evangelical church, but not in the sense that we use the word evangelical in this country. I mean, uh, it, it, any church from the Reformation was considered an evangelical church. Uh, and um, it, the Catholic Church also uh, had a number of things that were happening at the time. Um, uh, I think there was a sense in which both, like the, like the evangelical church, there were press, uh, pushes and pulls that were occurring. So there were some who were supportive of it. Obviously, uh, this could be a reestablishment of the Holy Roman Empire. <laughs> Right? This was some of the language, so there was a sense in which uh, things were changing, but the German context was not primarily Roman Catholic. So um, I think there's been a lot of uh, criticism since the time uh, following World War II that, that the church generally, and the Roman Catholic Church along with other churches, were so passive in the face of what was happening. But of course, it was hard for people to believe what was happening. Um, you know, there was a sense in which 
these stories were leaking out about these concentration camps, but nobody could really believe it in a sense. Carol, do you want to? Talk? I just wanted to say there are, there are some regions in throughout Germany um, that are distinctly Roman, and especially at that time, distinctly Roman Catholic, and that would have been the southern areas, Bavaria. Uh, today it's a mixture, but at that time, 70, 80 percent were Roman Catholic. Um, and along the Rhineland, um, a lot of people left, for instance, during, after the Thirty Years' War and other, the, other, the subsequent wars, and came to the United States and, uh, because that was Roman Catholic. The Lutheran areas, or the, the evangelical areas, Lutheran areas, Protestant areas, were all in the north and east, what, is, what became East Germany over those, uh, those years. <laughs> I'm just going to make a comment. Uh, we'd like you to use the microphone because we're recording this, and that way we can hear the question. Yes, Sue. I just have a comment. Um, my father was a commercial fisherman. My parents and two brothers were born in Norway. And my father was a commercial fisherman in New York. And he could tell from you know the United States that the Nazis were going to be sweeping over Europe. He went back to Norway, and he told the relatives and said to my mother, you have to leave with the boys. And they all mocked him. They said nothing was going to happen. I mean, they, they just didn't have the realization. They thought, who was this guy? Nothing would happen. My father insisted that my mother come. And so she came on the last boat. And then the Nazis arrived in international Red Cross trucks in Oslo and took over for the next four years. And then um, my aunt, Sloy, who died last year, my mother used to say, oh, you know, they worked with the underground, the Norwegians, and I thought, well, but my sister went back there. And my um, uncle sang in a church choir, and my aunt Sloy played the piano. And the Nazis let them travel because they thought, how could the church people and Christians be a threat? But they were traveling with codes and that sort of thing to help the underground. But my aunt Sulbe never talked about this at all, and I didn't know it until many years later. So that's my comment. Great, thank you, Sue. There are lots of people, and many people in this room, who have such personal experience of that period. Uh, Ralph Hamburger, who was one of the uh, retired Presbyterian minister who worshipped with us for many, many years and died just recently. Uh, he was born in, in Germany and his father was Jewish. Uh, and uh, they could see what was happening. On one occasion his father was beaten by the stormtroopers and he said, we got to get out. And they got out, uh, but that didn't help because where they went eventually were taken over by the Nazis as well, and he fought in the resistance as well. So there are many personal stories right here in our midst that are quite remarkable. Thank you, Sue. Another so, question? Yes, what was Hitler's um, promise to the people that would mobilize so many youth into youth camps, so many people into supporting him, and what type of structure did he create that could, could then uh, amp fulfill his ambitions and what are your plans for the summer trip? <laughs> so the trip will lead to Jeff. I can answer a few of them. Or I'll try to answer a few of the, the, the previous ones. Um, <clears throat> I would read stories, um, not just in preparation for this, but in, in my life, about all of the sports that were taking place. Um, it was important to be powerful. It was important to be in good shape. It was, um, you know, it wasn't just about uh, having a clean house and uh, and doing everything according to the Protestant ethic, but uh, there was something that had to do with the physical body. And there was a lot of, um, as, as people started to move in, as, as Hitler moved in, and they started to see a lot of uh, parades, all of a sudden a number of parades, and everything had a parade. Um, you won a game, so therefore you went on a parade. Uh, it started to build up what we think of as the Prussian uh, <coughs> of militarism, but this was going in a different direction. It was, it was like, um, 
it, it's important to show some strength. If that helps to answer a little bit of what you're pointing at. Uh, let me respond while uh, Hugh gets the microphone to the trip. So, um, knowing that Ober Armagau is uh, the passion play is only every decade, um, we began to make plans to uh, to visit for the 2020 performance, and uh, it was kind of curious because uh, quite some time ago, in order to get tickets and rooms in Omer Abergau, uh, we had to, to put down $750 a person or $1,500 a couple uh, without knowing flights, without knowing what else was going to happen on the trip, without knowing what the other pieces were. And, um, and surprisingly, there were 39 people that did that. So we've got a group of 39 that are planning to go, leaving on June the 26th. And um, that performance is, uh, the performance that we'll attend is on July the 4th in ober uh, And then uh, there's a little additional piece of the trip for those who want to that will take us into France and we'll go to Normandy and to Paris. So this, uh, this experience of sort of the history of the, the, the history of Germany in the 20th century is part of our preparation for that. As a matter of fact, I remember Jim Jeff saying to me in the preparation period um, that Bonhoeffer was going to be the kind of the thread for this mm -hmm. this trip, and um, so I, I had mentioned that I would love to do. There's a book of 365 sayings of Bonhoeffer. I haven't seen it in English, but I have in German. So I would like to do you know, one of those a day um, and just send it on with Jeff, Jeff and then I'd do some meditations out of it or something, just a translation of it. So Bonhoeffer thread is what got us started, I guess. That's right. That's right. Uh, thanks for sharing some of the perspectives and the personal stories. It seems to me that one of the elements that, that can help explain the strength of the German support was the threat perceived by the Soviets and the Bolsheviks and that the uh, Christian church seemed to take on an identity of defending Western culture against the, the Soviets and the communists that were clearly not Christian. Uh, there was a strong German Communist Party. Could you address that in the, this period of time? I don't know that I, I can, but I think that's uh, certainly a contributing factor, um, I, I think. As the video suggested at the beginning, there were so many changes that were taking place uh, and the map of Europe was being redrawn at the end of World War I. We'll hear more about that next week, I'm sure. But um, uh, these, these uh, I mean, Karl Marx and, and uh, communist ideology was taking hold in places like Russia. So. Uh, there was a sense in which we need to defend the faith, right? Um, but in the defense of faith, uh, you know, the empowerment of the state became a real problem. And this was what caused such a reaction from ministers in Germany that said, no, we, we do not proclaim anything but the gospel in these pulpits. Uh, and so therefore, uh, there has to be this separation. Yes, uh, we've, is there a mic here? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, Phil. Following on your point about pastors, could, what happened to the emergency group of 7,000 that stood up and then we never hear, heard about it again? Well, I think the Confessing Church Movement, you'll hear more about this later, um, the Confessing Church Movement really broke away, and as I said, Bonhoeffer you know, was teaching at their own seminary, so there was a division that occurred, um, and there was increasing efforts to silence the critics, as you can see in Bonhoeffer's own life. He's, he's not allowed to be a pastor, he's not allowed to speak, he's finally arrested. Uh, so there was uh, increasing uh, escalation 
of the ability to, or the desire to muzzle the critics. Um, but the, the, those critics were developing throughout the, the culture, even within uh, Hitler's own uh, military. So uh, there were lots of challenges that they were facing, and this is history. It is just complex and messy. Um, I don't know fundamentally what happened to the Confessing Church mo movement after this period, uh, after the defeat of Germany, um, but certainly people like Bonhoeffer have been lifted up, and the, the neo-Orthodox movement that Karl Barth articulated so well in the Church Dogmatics became a powerful theological force. And you'll hear more about that at the end of the month because that Barman Declaration was included in our confessional documents in the Presbyterian Church. Can you say something about the support for Hitler and the Nazi movement here in America? I don't know that I can. I don't think I can either. I'm Irish. <laughs> I was looking for my face. About Yeah, we're in just Federation, Women's Federation. Um, it's, a, it's a group that gets together, but I, I don't know enough about that. Um, I mean, we're picking up on some things that that are really, we got to start learning about. Mm -hmm. it, it, yes, one last question. Yeah. <coughs> Jeff, and yeah. the classic service uh, this morning, you made reference to Bono, and uh, I'm not sure I quote this right, but to the effect of cheap faith or hypocrisy. Cheap grace. Cheap grace. grace. Can you expand what, what, who was Bonhoeffer speaking to or writing to when that comment was made? This is the, his little book, The Cost of Discipleship, in which he talks about this concept. And I think Bonhoeffer's concern was that um, there was a sense in church, and we know this from sort of a, the Christendom model of church, that uh, you're baptized into the church, and so you're good. You're covered, right? Um, that this is God's grace. And no matter what you do or how you behave, uh, this is the, the grace of God. It covers you. You don't have to worry about it anymore. And he was arguing that's what he calls cheap grace. Because the grace that God calls us to in Christ, he says he, he bids us come and die to ourselves to pick up the cause of Christ. And so... Uh, he was really arguing against this German Christian ideology, right? Um, and and uh, I, I've forgotten the exact timing of this when the cost of discipleship, uh, 1937, uh, was published. So he's teaching in Finkenwald, and the Confessing Church movement has been in existence for about four years. Uh, so he was writing in that context, and this was a critique of what was happening in the German Christian Church. All right, well, I think, um, I think that's about all we have time for. So thank you very much, and we'll see you again next week.